I'm Adrian, the cruise and travel guy. I just recently returned from 10 nights on board Norwegian Cruise Line's smallest and oldest ship. And in this video, I'll give you a complete cruise review. So sit back, relax and enjoy. And if you haven't hit the subscribe button yet, please do. I've been fascinated with NCL for a long time. Compared to the likes of Royal Caribbean and Princess or Carnival, they don't have a large presence in Australia and New Zealand. So the opportunity to experience one of their ships was something I jumped at. On board, Norwegian Spirit is an elegant and smart ship. Despite being the smallest and oldest one in the NCL fleet, she feels fresh, contemporary, and dare I say, quite luxurious in many ways. That's all thanks to a US $100 million refit that was completed in 2020. And you can watch a full walkthrough ship tour on my channel. I've linked to the video in the description below. Her 75,000 tons makes her borderline small by today's standards. But on board, that manifests itself with an easy to navigate layout with no major sensation of crowding, even at elevator banks. Oh, and getting around easily on board was aided by this nifty detail in the passenger corridors. Follow the fish to walk forward, and walk against them to head aft. Despite her smaller size, she still offers a huge variety of venues of which you've come to expect from modern cruising. So let's take a look at what it's like to eat on board Norwegian Spirit. Not including room service or the onboard cafe, there are 10 dining venues on board. Five are included and five are classified as specialty venues. In the included range, the local is incredibly popular, not least of all because it's open 24 seven. Think bar or pub style food options and you'll be in the ballpark of what's on offer at the local, but they also offer some specials based on the region that the ship is sailing in. All options are available a la carte. I tried a special called Luro Fan and while I can't say it packed a flavor punch like you'd experience on land, it was nice to see something offered that echoed the waters we were sailing in. On the regular menu, wings, burgers and salads were the highlight for sure, plus there were even sundaes for desserts. All were prepared to order and very tasty. The local also offers a breakfast menu every morning, which was a nice middle ground compared to the full experience in the main restaurant and to the informality of the buffet. My only criticism was that eggs any style actually means eggs one of two ways, fried or scrambled. In the ship's main restaurants, passengers can enjoy breakfast daily and dinner daily, while lunch is offered on sea days. For breakfast, there was an extensive menu, with some specials listed under daily features and a handy express option for guests looking to dine and dash. That was probably a good choice for those in a rush, as breakfast in the main restaurant, particularly during busy periods, could take a while. I wouldn't call it slow, but maybe relaxed. The dishes I ordered were cooked well and presented nicely. Although I have to go on record and say that a breakfast potato is a terribly poor alternative to a hash brown. The restaurants themselves, particularly windows, the aftmost dining room, are lovely places to spend time in. There's a real sense of grandeur, thanks to the stately windows, light fixtures, and carpeting. It's probably one of my favorite places on board. If you arrive early enough for mealtime, you can even request a table near the windows. Whilst we didn't have an opportunity to enjoy lunch in the dining room during our cruise, we did have dinner there, and service and the food was quite good. Service was attentive without being pushy, and although main dining on ships can sometimes feel a bit mechanical, our servers were always friendly and took the time to check in with us. The restaurant opened at around 5.30 for dinner and went through till about 9 or 9.30 and you could either make a reservation each day of the cruise if you liked, or you could just go to the restaurant when you were ready to eat and you would be called to a table when one was ready. For dinner one night, we also tried Silk, another included dining option that was open exclusively at dinner time. Silk specializes in Asian cuisine and the food here was outstanding. Occasionally on board cruise ships, I can find that some of the restaurants that exclusively offer a particular type of cuisine maybe lack flavor or punch, especially compared to options that you'll find on land. But I have to say that Silk, without a doubt, 
was not one of those. The food was delicious. The taste was really similar to restaurants I've enjoyed on land. The menu variety was really solid as well. I'm just disappointed that I didn't get to go twice. When it comes to casual buffet dining, the Garden Cafe is your go-to. Occupying the top deck space between the midship pool and the aft adults only area, it was super easy to access from both indoors and out. At breakfast, there was a wide range of hot and cold options, including pre-made omelets and eggs, but chefs were also on hand to freshly prepare them to your tastes if preferred. During lunch and dinner time, there was a wide variety of options with specials as well. There were roasts and meat dishes, Asian cuisine options, a pasta station, pizza, and lots more. Outside of main meal times, there were a small number of sweet and savory treats on offer, which was a nice addition, providing people with the opportunity to quickly and easily grab a snack between mealtime. I loved that even during peak times, say breakfast on a port day, there was always somewhere to sit, and if not inside the restaurant, then even on the pool deck or by the aft area near the adults only deck. All of the tables, whether outside or in, had condiments and cutlery ready to go. The aft section in particular is fantastic. There are multiple sprawling decks of outdoor dining and lounging space. It just made it feel really fuss free. On the specialty dining front, Spirit belies her size once again, offering five restaurants to choose from. Onda by Scarpetta, Le Bistro, Cagney's, Teppanyaki and the sushi bar. With the exception of Teppanyaki, NCL doesn't offer a standard cover charge for its specialty restaurants. Instead, it operates like a restaurant on Landwood with a menu with a la carte pricing for each item. Many guests on board NCL book their voyages using the cruise line's free at sea program. I'll speak more about it soon, but it's essentially a promotion that provides guests with perks that can include specialty dining. That perk means that guests can book in at one of the venues for no cost and then choose a starter, a salad or soup, a main course and a dessert although the specifics depend on the restaurant and the menu. Travelers can also pre-purchase specialty dining packages online before their cruise, which provides that same experience. Happily, we had the chance to sample all of the specialty venues on board Spirit. Teppanyaki is as fun as you can imagine. Not only do the chefs provide a side of entertainment, showing off their training and skills, but the food is terrific and plentiful. I highly recommend a visit at least once during your cruise. When it comes to ambience and interior design, Onda by Scarpetta was my favorite. The beautiful decor is matched with beautifully prepared Italian food. A basket of freshly made focaccia was really hard to resist and in fact we might have asked for seconds. From starters to pastas and main courses, the food here was excellent. Le Bistro is a cozy French restaurant located on the ship's promenade deck. As you'd imagine, the food here is rich. Crusty baguette with mounds of luscious butter, pan seeds, scallops, goat cheese croquettes, Dover sole, and desserts to stop your heart. Cagney's quickly became my favorite though, both for the exceptional service and the food. Let's be honest, classic steakhouses are generally hard to fault. Here I enjoyed absolutely everything, from the beautifully cooked steaks to the range of sides and desserts. But somewhat embarrassingly, my favorite dish was the wedge salad. It was just so good. I was surprised though that a main course order didn't come with an included side, and that each attracted an a la carte charge. I think one side should at least be included with any main course. For dessert, the eight layer chocolate cake was Michael's favorite. The sushi bar occupies a little nook at the front of the silk and teppanyaki restaurant. Sushi rolls were made fresh to order and could be tailored if you didn't care for a particular ingredient. We tried a whole bunch of things, including the sushi, nigiri, seaweed salad, and edamame, and all were totally delicious. At night, those having dinner in the included venue, Silk, could order items from the sushi bar to accompany their meal at a la carte prices. When it came time to relax on board the ship, there was a huge variety of public spaces to choose from, both indoors and out. The local was great for its casual, fun atmosphere with its undeniable sports bar vibe. Henry's Pub felt like your cozy neighborhood bar, with a real timber floor and classic pub furniture helping to set the mood. Regular music sets by night added to the fun, 
and it was a great place for a nightcap. Magnum Champagne Bar stepped things up with its luxurious fit out and central atrium location, lending it an air of sophistication. The bottles of champagne didn't hurt either. I was also happy that Magnum seating extended right around the upper atrium level, with servers continually doing the rounds and taking orders. So finding somewhere to sit around here was never really a problem. The social club located all the way forward was a bit of a strange one. I understood it would have been used for comedy shows and other entertainment, but instead it was generally used as a kids club venue. That's because Spirit lacks any dedicated kids club facilities, which is no big surprise as Spirit has really been tailored for the adult cruise experience, focused more on the destination. To be clear though, children are still allowed on board. That did mean though that the social club was a bit of a dead zone in the early evening, while kids only game competitions were held. The area would change over to become a nightclub of sorts from about 11 p.m. every night, but on a port intensive cruise like ours, it just never really took off and things would generally wind up quite early. Spinnaker Lounge was without a doubt my favorite venue. After a long day of exploring on shore, we would typically start our evenings here with a pre-dinner drink. The ambience was perfection, helped along by background music that was at just the right volume to enjoy conversation. I love an observation lounge, but throw in a huge variety of seating nooks with comfy furnishings and unimpeded views, a stunning central bar, a dance floor and a bandstand, and you pretty much have the perfect venue. NCL also used the space for hosted events like bingo, trivia and passenger competitions. At other times there would also be live music and bands and dancing, and later in the evening things here would wind up and move down to the social club, and we were told that's because of Spinnaker's location both above the bridge and officers quarters. Outdoors, Spirit really excels and stands as a reminder that smaller ships of an older era come with some hard to beat advantages. For starters, she has a proper wraparound promenade deck, a feature you just don't see coming out of shipyards anymore. The top decks likewise are expansive and open with plenty of places to just soak in those ocean views. Whether forward, midship or aft, there were so many places to enjoy outdoors. Spirit is undeniably one of the best ships if you enjoy feeling like you're on a ship. The beer garden was lovely, in particular because of the huge sunshade. It meant people could enjoy some time outdoors with or without sitting in direct sunlight. It is worth noting though that one half of the bar is a dedicated smoking zone. Aft, the adults only Spice H2O is a brilliant place to enjoy during a sea day. The terraced stern of spirit is fully utilized here, with a pool, hot tubs, bar and plenty of sun lounges occupying the lowest level. Above and spanning across a number of the cascading deck spaces, additional sun lounges, as well as dining and more casual lounging areas line the decks. Several of the upper passenger accommodation decks also exit right out onto Spice H2O, so it makes it really convenient to get to from your cabin. The garden cafe also has an entry point from here, and there's a second bar, which really means sea days can be completely relaxed and fuss free if that's your style of cruising. We stayed in a balcony cabin and I have a separate walkthrough tour which you can watch, I've linked to it in the description below. The cabin itself presents nicely, benefiting from the ship's 2020 upgrade. It's not a large cabin and the smaller size is one of the things that couldn't be corrected during a makeover. Having said that, the cabin felt well considered. There was ample storage for two of us, admittedly overpacked adults, who had brought more than needed for a two week trip. Virgin Voyagers could learn a thing or two here. I would have appreciated a larger television though, and an on demand entertainment system like Princess Cruises offers. The bathroom had a practical layout with three distinct zones, and the shower was spacious with a glass door. And don't forget that suitcases do slide under the bed, which gives you more room in the cabin. Service all over the ship was as good as I had ever experienced. There was really never any delay in flagging someone down. If I wanted to order a drink, for example, there was always someone nearby. Thanks to an old knee injury, I had to cancel a pre-booked shore excursion within 24 hours of the tour. That meant I was well within the cancellation period that would mean I would not get a refund, which was totally fine. Without me even asking, the crew member suggested that he could try and resell the tickets to another passenger and he did, 
and we ended up getting a refund. And that was something that was just one of those customer service experience moments that you always remember. A couple of our ports were also canceled due to weather, which I'll talk more about soon, but when the announcement was made over the PA system to let us know about the schedule change, we were also told that passengers with private shore excursion arrangements could go to the main dining room, where a communication center was set up for people to contact their tour operators. That was next level attention to detail for tours that weren't even operated or sold by NCL. And finally, it's a small thing, but I also really enjoyed that bar snacks were offered in the evenings. It was an elegant touch and one you typically see on much higher end cruise lines. On the entertainment front, Spirit offers a two-level theatre for main event showtime. We watched a couple of excellent performances, though I wasn't really allowed to film or capture them in any detail. An early and a late seating meant that most people were able to get to showtime without fuss, with the theatre doors opening 30 minutes before the show start time. I especially liked the upper balcony seating, which provided an excellent view. In other venues around the ship, live music was a big part of the entertainment roster, with bands, vocalists and pianists staying throughout at different times. NCL's credo is all about freestyle cruising, which really allows travelers to follow their own bliss while on board. Whether that means fine dining or casual meals al fresco, dressing up or dressing down. To that end, the overall feel on board skews more towards casual, which especially suited our port intensive crews. In terms of an official dress code, NCL advertises cruise casual, which allows for swimwear in the buffet and outdoor restaurants, and shorts and t-shirts pretty much everywhere else. Thongs or flip-flops are okay throughout the ship, but not permitted in the main or specialty dining rooms. While I'm not a big fan of black tie formal nights, I have to admit at the beginning of the cruise, I was a little bit not shocked, that's too strong a word, but I was surprised to see people wearing shorts and thongs or flip-flops in bar venues after dark. I got used to it, but it's just not something that I'm familiar with from most of my previous time on other cruise lines. NCL has really bridged the gap between extra charge cruising and all-inclusive cruising with its free at sea program. Essentially, it's an evergreen promotion of sorts that provides travelers with a range of inclusions as part of their fare. It's usually available on cruises of three or more nights in duration. It's important to check the specifics of your cruise and whatever promotions available before you book, but generally guests can pick between five included options, which might span from internet and a drinks package to reduce rates for third and fourth guests. It's also worth noting that for Australian and New Zealand travellers, gratuities, even those associated with beverage packages and specialty dining, are all inclusive. Our particular itinerary was 10 nights in duration and began in Tokyo. The ship then sailed south towards Taiwan, with scheduled stops in Shimizu, Nagoya, Kobe, Kochi, Naha, Miyakojima, Hualien, and then finally, Kilung. Thanks to weather, we were forced to skip our stop in Nagoya, replaced with a day at sea, as well as our stop in Miyakojima, replaced with an overnight stop in Naha. Due to the recent and horrific earthquake in Taiwan, our call into Hualien was also replaced with an overnight stay in Kilung, which is also where we disembarked. I'll soon publish a separate video detailing the ports and our onshore experiences. It might be on the channel by the time you watch this. Overall though, Japan is an incredible destination to cruise. The people are so friendly, it's easy to get around, even by yourself. The sights are stunning, and the food especially was one of my favorite things to experience and enjoy during Ports of Call. We also chose to take two NCL shore excursions, which I will detail in the upcoming video. As a cruise taking place at the beginning of Japan's summer, Wet weather was a possibility, and unfortunately, we did experience more than our share of wet days. I would probably recommend a cruise earlier in the year, potentially around the spring season, where you could even take advantage of cherry blossom season. Still, we didn't let the weather dampen our spirits, and we walked, walked, and walked everywhere we could. We saw as much as we could, irrespective of what the sky was doing. Those of you with weak stomachs look away now, but one of my favorite days on board was when we encountered a storm. It was actually the day we were meant to dock in Nagoya, and as evidenced by the weather we encountered at sea, it was for the best that we didn't call into port. 
The storm only lasted a few hours, but except for that short time, the rest of the cruise was smooth sailing, despite the rain being a fairly consistent companion. Norwegian Spirit is currently sailing in Asia, with bookings available between September 2024 and December 2025, at which point she'll reposition south to Australia and New Zealand via Singapore. In fact, I'm hosting a group cruise on board Norwegian Spirit in January 2026, and we'll be sailing from Sydney to Auckland for 11 nights. I've popped a link in the description below if you'd like to learn more and even reserve your spot on board. I really enjoyed my first cruise with NCL. Trying to position them based on my previous cruise experience, I would say they reminded me most of Royal Caribbean. But having said that, Norwegian Spirit is such a unique ship within the fleet. I can say with confidence that she has become one of my favorites. Her smaller size and fewer passengers means that on board, things never feel chaotic, but she still offers an enormous variety of public spaces. While her cabins are on the smaller side compared to newer vessels, I think it's a worthy trade-off for the overall cruise experience. These days, smaller scale ships are the norm for premium and luxury cruise lines, but most mainstream lines have long given up on smaller vessels. The fact that NCL not only still offers a variety of smaller ships, but that they chose to invest so heavily in ensuring Spirit remains a competitive choice in the 2020s, to me, speaks volumes about the guest experience NCL is trying to foster on board. And while I can't yet speak for the rest of NCL's fleet, Norwegian Spirit almost perfectly blends that ethos of modern cruising within a more elegant and traditional ocean-going package. I highly recommend a cruise on Norwegian Spirits, and if you'd like to book one, you can head to my website, thecruiseandtravelguide.com.au. I really hope you enjoyed the review, and you can watch the other videos like the tour for the ship and the tour for the cabin, and very soon, if it's not available at the moment, you'll find my Japan review as well. Thanks so much for watching, I hope you enjoyed. Give me a follow on Facebook and Instagram at the Cruise and Travel Guy, and make sure you subscribe to the channel to stay up to date with all of my content. Thanks again, and I'll see you soon.